I'm Susan Boster. I'm the founder and CEO of Boster Group, a firm I set up about 20 years ago to put together partnerships between corporations and cultural arts institutions and social impact foundations. I'm so happy to be back on this mountain with all of you in this inclusive space, speaking in person, what a joy, um, with business leaders I truly, truly admire. It's been great to get to know you guys over the past few weeks in the lead up. Um, as the world grapples with a less optimistic economic outlook than we were hoping for, the temptation for many corporations that you all serve in and individual leaders to turn inwards. Um, trust becomes more difficult and more important. A lot of you have seen the trust barometer that came out of Edelman yesterday. If not, take a look. And this can drive even the most strategic among us to underestimate the value of collaboration and partnership. So today we're going to talk about corporations and brands who've seen their investments in long-term relationships create value and resilience through good times and bad. I'm delighted to be sharing the insights of two incredibly impressive women and get their thoughts on what all this means for approaching partnerships going forward. Um, let me start out with the first woman to my left, Yvonne Garcia. Yvonne is the Chief of Staff of State Street's CEO, Ron O'Hanley, as well as their Global Head of Internal Communications and the Head of State Street's CEO Experience Program. In addition, she's co-founded, serves, and chairs the boards of a series of U.S. nonprofits committed to supporting corporate diversity and access to resources for marginalized communities. By leveraging partnerships, Yvonne is able to drive measurable change across sectors and make significant strides towards social equality through financial services, NGOs, and even across culture. State Street's commission, Fearless Girl, can someone back there point to it for me? Have you guys seen her when you walked in? Yay. Uh, Fearless Girl um, is an example how real corporate action paired with culture can amplify potential impact and impact. And you're going to learn more about the Fearless Girl a little bit later on in our discussion here. Secondly, I'd like to um, welcome Esgi Barsenas. Esgi is the Chief Sustainability Officer at Anheuser-Busch InBev, and in this role she oversees a diverse range of partnerships. Internally, her inclusive leadership style and team of teams approach, which she's talked about at Davos before, so you guys can check that out, enable her to be an effective CSO, championing change across a multifaceted global company to embed sustainability across the business. So let's get started. Um, Both. I wanted to ask you, you know, one of the great benefits of partnership is that you can create financial value as well as environmental, social, brand, and intellectual or innovation value, to name just a few. What non-financial drivers inform your approach to partnership? Well, thank you, first of all. It really is a pleasure to get to know both of you more, and it's a privilege to share the stage with you. So happy to be here. Um, you know, in terms of non-financial um, drivers, I would say it's really important that your purpose and mission align with the organization that you're partnering with, um, that um, there's great leadership, good governance, right? The, um, that they have clear objectives, that they measure um, their success and their milestones. Um, and that it's correlated to what's important for your organization, whether in, in my case, you know, workforce development, recruitment of diverse talent, et cetera. Uh, so th when I think of partnerships, it's mostly non-financial to me. It's really what matters around purpose, mission, governance, leadership. Great. Thanks, Yvonne. Esky, how about for you? 
Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. So for those of you that may not be familiar with AB InBev, we are the world's leading brewers. Some of our uh, brands include Budweiser, Stella Artois, Corona. Um, we have operations across nearly 50 countries around the world. So we're a global company, but deeply rooted in local communities. So for us, when we think of partnerships, you know, it's not just a partnership within one office or one country. It's actually partnerships across functions, across geographies. And my role, I try to bridge the divides. You know, I try to create the spaces and, and, and time for people to come together from different backgrounds and tackle a shared challenge. So um, I think innovation definitely plays a big role in that. The other piece that we see is really um, the sense of purpose. Uh, the sense of pride that it, it offers uh, to our colleagues as well, right? So there is that, and I would say it's all, it almost is a side benefit. It's a byproduct, right? Um, and and it becomes this virtuous cycle where you know the more you invite people in, the more they innovate, they they, they embrace risk and innovation and collaboration because it does not come naturally to people, right? They're usually very used to working in silos within their own departments or functions. And the more you create those spaces, the more they see the power and how you can unlock the power of partnerships. Amazing. And Eski, can I just ask you, did experiencing the management of partnerships in a challenging environment in any way change your approach to them going forward? Um, you know, I would, I would say when we live in a fast evolving world, um, rapidly changing, and and I think you know what we've lived through the last few years. We realize that when the risk is perceived to be imminent or real or or shared, people really raise their hands and, and they put up their hands and they ask uh, to join and and to partner in new ways that they haven't partnered before. Uh, so those moments of crisis when people come together, what we've really learned is. You know, how do we then actually continue that momentum and, and keep bringing people together in those everyday settings so that, because they've proven to themselves and to others that it can be done. You know, you can approach something in an in interdisciplinary fashion or in a cross-functional way. So there are definitely many, uh, many learnings in that, in that process. If anything, you've proven to yourself that you can work across functions and you can still work with agility. Because many times people really think, if I work alone, I can go faster. And we always say you can go farther if you work together, but you can also go faster when you work together and you just need to prove it, you know, and, and you need that reason to believe. Fantastic insight. And Yvonne, can you share what you've learned about the value of partnerships across sectors? A lot of what Asghe just um, shared really resonates because um, during the pandemic, for example, um, our chairman and CEO uh, would walk to the office and noticed a lot of small businesses were boarded up. He said, you know, we really need to do something, especially for minority-owned and women-led businesses that are disproportionately affected. So, um, this, and this is a great story of what happens when corporate, nonprofit, private come together across sectors. We, um, we started an organization called Small Business Strong, where we leveraged the relationships across all these sectors, um, provided free technical advice to all of these small businesses. You know, two years later, we've served, you know, served 3,000 small businesses, 7,000 volunteer hours, and leveraged 200 volunteers from all areas. So from the community, media, um, government, uh, all, all the corporations lined up you know, their employees to help provide uh, this advice. When you think of all the intellectual assets you know, we all have, bringing that to the community right, and, and uh, helping them get through the pandemic really was a great representation um, testament to the power, of, you know, the power when we all join forces. And the power of building in the resilience, because those numbers are great, and they'll only just grow going forward. Um, and going back, you know, Esgi, you were talking about this, I'm sure Yvonne as well. You know, how do you motivate and inspire your colleagues to avoid the impulse to turn inwards? Because we're all going to start seeing that, right? Everyone's going to be like, oh, let me keep my head below the parapet. I don't want to get messed up and lose my job here. How do you motivate and inspire your colleagues to avoid the impulse to turn inwards and avoid partnership in times of uncertainty. Yeah, um, so we try to firstly hardwire the business as well, right? So, um, you know, in, in my role um, as the chief sustainability officer, it, it's not my small team. I have a small but mighty team, but it's not just that small team that delivers all our, all our sustainability ambitions for for the for the company. It's actually my team of teams, as I mentioned before. And just last year, you know, I cascaded targets. So. 
um, at ABI, we're very target driven. We carry uh, targets linked to our bonus, our annual compensation. Uh, we were able to set and cascade targets to eight different functions within the business. So that's the hard wiring, right? If you can cascade that throughout the business from a packaging innovation specialist to a corporate affairs manager, um, you know, a brand director, a, a climate leader, whatever it may be, um, you know, someone sitting in treasury, et cetera. That's the hard wiring. But then your question around motivation, how do you motivate people? I think, you know, everyone is looking for that heightened sense of purpose in, in what they do every day. We all pursue that innovation, the, the, the new breakthroughs that are out there. Um, and we're all trying to prove to ourselves that a, a better future is possible. And you know, when you're sitting in this role, you need to have a belief system that a better future is possible and that you can actually help be part of creating that future with others, right? So um, it intrinsically come, come to our, um, comes to our employees, our, our colleagues, and also our partners as well, I would say. And you know, uh, going back to the point uh, Yvonne made during the pandemic, you know, we work with uh, globally about six million retailers around the world. Over five million of them are micro, small size enterprises, the mom and pop shops around the corner that serve that neighborhood. You know, these are the social entrepreneurs, and um, you know, we help support them in financial literacy, inventory management, um, you know, contactless payments throughout the pandemic, and we do that to create that business resilience and continuity, but again, uh, what that does is it closes the gaps in, in financial inclusion, digital inclusion. So uh, that also motivates our sales teams to see that because now they can they can see an additional impact, an additional benefit of their everyday engagement with that with that retail. That's amazing. You developed those prog programs. I didn't know that. That's fantastic to hear. You know, many ways, um, Esgi, when I look at your role. It's an innovation role. And actually, when we first wrote this question at Boster Group, I was like, is there a chief innovation officer that I'm going to upset here? But I did. I, I looked at her role, and I thought, gee, she's a CSO, but she's, she's a real innovator. In order to solve for the biggest environmental challenges, um, we need new solutions and technologies, as we all know. And as part of your leadership at AB InBev has been identifying, investing, and scaling these solutions through partners. Uh, what lessons can you share about partnering to develop new products and processes? Um, maybe I can uh, take a step back and tell you a little bit more about the innovation side of, of, of my role. Um, so when we set our sustainability commitments, the, the latest set of uh, public commitments we had back in 2018, you know, we were very honest about, hey, we know how to get there 85, 90% of the way, but the remaining 10, 15% we're gonna have to identify breakthrough technologies, new partners, creative ways of working. Um, and our CEO at the time asked me, well, how, how are you gonna do that, Isgi? And I said, well, we're gonna go and, and look into the startup world and you know find those social innovators, entrepreneurs that are out there. And in, in true ABI fashion, within a matter of a few months, we launched the 100 plus accelerator program. And, and in the last four years, we've now in the fourth cohort, together with the fourth cohort, we were accelerating nearly 120 companies um, in 30 plus countries around the world. And, um, it was so successful in the first two years because we were able to uh, pilot solutions, scale them up, and then offer about half of them commercial contracts to, to live on in our supply chain. We then invited Unilever, Coca-Cola, and Colgate Palmolive to be part of the accelerator. So now we jointly source, identify, pilot, and scale innovations. And what you're really finding out is that we all are trying to, in the consumer goods uh, sector, we're all trying to identify uh, the same type of solutions. And sometimes you can look at a solution and you can say, um, you know, I'm gonna test a different use case of this solution or a different geography, but that really accelerates the learnings and we can share those insights, the learnings, and then we will launch them to the world. So for us, again, this is about, you know, how do you um, share those learnings uh, with others as well? And, and it all comes through partnerships because if you don't approach them through a partnership mindset and if you don't pursue what the future looks like, um, you know, you will always be stuck in the present or you're going to try to catch up. Um, so I think the role, sustainability role, you always have to keep an eye on the future and really build that forward-looking agenda. And I love the fact, you guys heard that, they work with all these other FMCG companies, so they're able to take it and really scale it. That's such a great example. Yvonne, fearless girl, who again is back here. You guys have to see her. Who knows who she is? Does everyone know who she is? Okay, you're going to learn more. Um, She's approaching her sixth anniversary standing watch at the New York Stock Exchange. Do you guys remember this now in front of the bull? Um, can you share some of the impact the statue has had on bringing more equality 
to corporate boards. Great, thanks. And, and that was you know, Shelly's idea. She said, uh, next year I want the fearless girl here because uh, she said everyone on stage um, is a fearless woman and it was really appropriate. So really glad that she shared that idea and that we were able to bring her here. Uh, you know, She was really meant to be inspirational, aspirational. I think the best pictures that she has are when little girls are, are posing next to her. And that um, you know allows for conversations to happen around the dinner table with the moms and dads about what she represents. But you're exactly right. She um, represents really part of her launch, when we launched a campaign, was about increasing gender diversity on boards. Um, since her launch, we've um, targeted over 1,500 companies that did not have um, women directors. Now over 60% of those companies have at least one woman director, you know. And when you um, when you think about, I mean, early in the panel earlier on, somebody talked about women leaving the workforce, especially during the pandemic. You know, there's still so much work to do. You know, close to two million women have left the workforce since the pandemic. Uh, so she also represents, you know, the need um, and desire to continue to um, you know to fight that fight of how do we continue to get more representation of women um, on boards and on leadership roles. This year we will focus on voting proxies, um, where we um, will go to some of the larger indices like Russell 3000, and we'll and check to see if they have at least 30 percent representation of women on boards. If not, we'll vote against um, you know the nominating um, committee chair. Um, or the board leader. How about um, that? <laughs> Woo! I clap if I could. It's amazing. Well done. Um, I'm going to move on here about investment in multi-year partnerships. And how do you identify the right partners to make long-term commitments to? Can I start with you, Esgi? How do you, how do, you do that? And maybe I know you do it across a lot of different sectors, but mm -hmm. how do you identify that's the right partner for us? Um, vision is very important for us. So how do you make sure that that partner shares the same or similar vision as yours? Because vision pulls you forward. For me, this is the biggest thing. Are they asking the right questions? Is it science driven? Um, are, is there local impact, tangible impact that we're pursuing? So for me, it's, it's those things. Um, but increasingly, we're also thinking of the shared accountability. Right, so um, because what you see, the successful partnerships are those where you're in for the long term, right? That you're looking at a multi-year future because, you know, change takes time and, and you can't expect results immediately. And, and we've seen it time and again where, you know, you expect results and you're impatient and then you drop off a partnership or, or a program and you don't give it uh, the, the, the passage of time for, for it to, to fully materialize. Um, so that shared accountability is really important for us. And, and how we create that in our partners so that we can look at back at a project and we can say, okay, for the last three, five, 10 years, we've been investing in this watershed. What are the uh, you know, measurable impacts and the KPIs that we can show or where the data is missing or the science is lacking that we can continue to help advance. Um, so the, the partners, the, the true partners are gonna be the ones that follow science, that have a vision, and that will continue to pursue um, that, that advancement, that progress. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yvonne, how about for you at State Street? Very similar, um, that shared purpose mission. Uh, when you look at uh, the viable partners, um, those that have good governance, um, that uh, have measurements in place, what gets um, you know, measured gets managed, um, that they have a long-term commitment, great leadership, um, and that they're aligned to, um, to our principles as well. So very similar to Asgi, um, exactly that. It's really about the purpose um, and how um, it aligns with what we believe in as well. And, and the bottom line is, you know, are they able to provide, um, impact the community right, in a positive way? So. so you guys have heard it here. When you move forward with partnerships and influencing this in your companies, the time is now to build this resiliency, but there's also a science behind it. It doesn't just happen by picking someone arbitrarily. These women have given us a lot of really great food for thought. I wanna thank all of you. I wanna thank Shelly Zalis. I wanna thank Talia from where she is in LA right now and Marisa who we met this year. If it weren't for you, we wouldn't have this important space to be able to do what we've been doing over the years. Thank you, thank you. I also wanna give a shout out to some sisters on my side, um, Yvonne and Esgi and sisters who came before. Everyone from Dame Vivian Hunt, who was the first person I ever interviewed, here to Dame Heather McGregor, who brought me along under my wing, and I wanna reach out to all of you to say, when you think about your next trip here, who's the woman you're bringing with you? I'm bringing George, and I'm thanking Maggie back in London for all the help she gave me. Thank you all today 
and have an awesome time. And go get your photo next to Fearless Girl. Shall we, Shall we ladies?